peripheral nerve entrapment is predisposed many times by metabolic disorders. We know that when a nerve has a metabolic disorder such as diabetic peripheral neuropathy, it causes that nerve to function differently. It causes it to swell, it has a higher water content, it becomes heavier, it has a larger cross-sectional diameter. So where these nerves end up going through tunnels, they become entrapped. And when they become entrapped in the tunnels, that causes a focal uh, demyelination of the nerve, which then leads to nerve damage. By removing that source of focal entrapment, the nerve has the ability to regenerate itself, and so patients are able to get restored sensation. Their pain reduction can be significant. Some studies show nearly 90% reduction in pain. Uh, for sensation, about 70% improvement. Additionally, we're finding that there are improvements in balance. When patients can feel their feet on the floor, they have better proprioception. Their brains know where they are in space. So that prevents a lot of falls. There are statistics that show many hip fractures are actually due to neuropathy. The patient can't feel their, their feet on the floor and they end up falling. A lot of people feel it or think that it's due to slipping in a bathtub or those types of things. And in fact, most of the time it's really, I think the statistics close to 70% of the time it's due to a neuropathy. So we're able to do a lot with peripheral nerve decompression from the standpoint of people with metabolic disease. And in fact, many times the peripheral nerve entrapment becomes the initial marker of the disease. So there are a lot of patients in the world that are pre-diabetic that have no idea and they'll come in with pain in a certain area. And what happens is when we work them up, it turns out that their focal nerve entrapment is due to a metabolic disease. And when we do our workup medically, we find out that these patients are in fact diabetic and they never knew that they were previously. If I had the answer to that, I would be ecstatic. I, I don't know, because conceptually, it's such a straightforward. The pathophysiology of peripheral nerve really is unchanged from upper extremity to lower extremity, except we have more biomechanical forces that go on in the lower extremity versus the upper extremity. But for some reason, we've been mired in this dogma for many, many years that it's perfectly fine to send a patient with uh, diabetic peripheral neuropathy and ha who has carpal tunnel syndrome over to a hand surgeon for nerve decompression and they get better. Their pain goes away and many times their sensation comes back. There really should be no difference in the lower extremity except you get in medicine a lot of dogma and it's believed because it's been passed on for such a long period of time. And that's what we're trying to do with these newer studies and, and with the uh, Association of Extremity Nerve Surgeons is get the word out that it really is no different other than the biomechanical standpoint. I think the most important thing that the primary care physician should realize is that most of the symptoms of diabetic peripheral neuropathy can be traced down to a superimposed nerve entrapment. And if you're anatomically aware of where these occur, both in the upper extremity and the lower extremity, you can do some very simple and quick clinical evaluation consisting of a provocation sign or a positive Tunnell sign. If these folks manifest that, then they're probably a very good candidate for a nerve decompression, and then they should refer those to someone who's a specialist and, and then can take it to that next step. That's a great question, and the answer is that if the geriatric patient has an adequate blood supply and they're a good medical candidate, then they're an ideal candidate for peripheral nerve decompression. In some ways, the geriatric patient is actually a better candidate compared to someone in the, in the middle stages of life from the standpoint that we are able to improve their balance and prevent hip fractures and, and, and things that have a very high morbidity associated with them. So if the, if the geriatric patient is in a good medical state, and we work up all these folks prior to any surgical nerve decompression, then they're an ideal candidate and they do very well. Uh, so we don't discriminate uh, from an age standpoint whether they're geriatric or non-geriatric.
One of the very interesting ones that we're picking up more and more of is patients that have had total knee arthroplasty and they can have continued pain after their knee implant and they can't figure out why they still have pain after this artificial knee. And they look at the CT scans, they look at the radiographs, everything's perfect, there's no evidence of any infection. I think statistically it's about 3% of all patients that have total knee arthroplasty end up with chronic pain uh, post-surgery. Interestingly enough, many times that's due to the fact that the common perineal nerve at the side of the leg is stretched or pulled when they're putting that knee implant in. And it's very easy to diagnose this because we can give a simple lidocaine injection over the common perineal nerve and within three to five minutes come back and the patient all of a sudden will tell you, yes, 100% of my pain is gone. I had a lady, for example, on Tuesday that had a total knee replacement, had continued pain for three to four years. I gave her a diagnostic lidocaine injection, came back in and she was doing deep knee bends. I can't believe that that little shot you just gave me relieved all that pain. So that's a very easy procedure. It's about a 14 minute procedure on an outpatient basis and all of a sudden this knee uh, implant that was so difficult from a post chronic surgical pain standpoint is a very easy thing to take care of. Another example is an ankle sprain. Ankle sprains tend to cause entrapments of the common perineal nerve up at the side of the leg just because of the uh, mechanics that go on. So if you have someone that has an ankle sp uh, sprain and they have continued pain more than three months after that ankle sprain, you need to start thinking about something other than the ligament and something other than the lateral ankle stabilization because it's very likely that they have either a superficial perineal nerve or a common perineal nerve or actually both nerve entrapments. That is correct and it is highly predictive in uh, peripheral nerve decompression. It's not highly predictive if we're, if we're obliged to do a denervation procedure where we have to take out a nerve. If we're able to block that pain generator with lidocaine and all that patient's pain goes away, but we're having to take the nerve and remove it, we're running about 50% as far as prognosticative uh, ability. If it's just a nerve decompression and I give a lidocaine block, we're in the very high 90 percentile from the standpoint that this patient's going to get better after a nerve decompression. So that while the nerve block itself will only last maybe 30 minutes to two hours with the lidocaine, it can be hugely predictive as far as who's going to fare well and who's not. In cases that don't respond to that, I'll usually bring back uh, the patient for a second uh, injection. And now that we're using diagnostic ultrasound to guide our injections, we have a very high specificity as far as getting the medication where we, we want it, and that has increased our accuracy as well. I think if the primary care physician was uh, adept in neuroanatomy and the lower extremity, upper extremity, and uh, felt comfortable about giving a lidocaine block, I think that's perfectly appropriate. It would be uh, a step that would would lead them probably to a faster referral and that is always good for the patient. Another interesting thing with peripheral nerve blocks that will sometimes happen is that you'll give them some lidocaine and we know it only lasts for a couple of hours at max but the patient will come back and say I had three weeks of relief from that injection. Well that's hard to believe but probably what's occurring is like rebooting your computer. So you're just kind of resetting it, you let that nerve calm down for a little bit, and then also what we'll see, which is very contra to what you would think, is that if you're putting lidocaine in around the common perineal nerve, you would think you would have actually a decrease in motor strength. But because the motor fiber is such a robust fiber and lidocaine causes vasodilation, we actually increase the blood flow in that area and sometimes post injection they'll actually have more strength rather than less which is very contrarian in bone.